This building may not be very familiar to you, but I'm sure that the magazines we make inside are. This is the home of Future Publishing, Europe's biggest publisher of computers magazines. My name's Steve Jarrett, and I'm the editor of one of those magazines, perhaps the best known of all, Amiga Format. Before we get down to business, perhaps you'd like to take a look inside. These are the offices of the biggest, best, and most famous Amiga magazine, Amiga Format. And here are a few of the people that work long and hard to bring you the most read Amiga magazine on the newsstands. Behind me is Sue White, Amiga Format's art editor. She's responsible for making sure the magazine looks as good as it does. This is Richard Jones. He's our production editor. He reads everything we write, takes out all the spelling mistakes, and makes sure it's fit to print. And this is Nick Veach, consultant editor and Amiga Format's resident technical expert. Anyway, let's leave them to get on with their work. Let's go to my desk. Following on from our last video, this tutorial explains more of the tricks, tips and techniques for making professional quality videos with the aid of your Amiga. We'll be taking a look at some of the equipment you might need, including standard video gear as well as the software and hardware available for the Amiga. Happy viewing and happy shooting. Hello there and welcome to our second video about desktop video. This time we're going to be taking a look at more advanced techniques involving the Amiga, but we're also going to take a look at a semi-professional studio setup and run through some basic editing techniques. Before we start, however, we thought it'd be good to run you through how a professional setup works. I'm in the editing rooms of filmmaker Derek Waterman of Croft Video Productions. Right, well, tell us something about it then. <laughs> well, Damien, the equipment behind me may look a bit complicated if you haven't seen it before, so I've drawn it up onto a computer to show you exactly what a simple edit suite comprises. Editing video is different from editing film. You don't cut the tape and stick it together again. Editing is a process of transferring from one machine to another by a copying process. This will give you perfectly satisfactory, somewhat rough and ready edits. In order to get more accuracy, you need an edit controller. Now you can make straight cuts quite accurately, but just cuts. If you want to do anything else, like mixes for instance, you need a second source machine and a vision mixer. But these are mechanical devices, and the images won't be exactly in synchronization. So some means of synchronizing them is necessary, and this is called a time-based corrector. Once you have this, you can make cuts, mixes, wipes, and any number of special effects. But that is just the picture. There's also sound, and some means is necessary of transferring sound from the two source machines to the edit machine, and controlling them in the process. But the sound mixer can also take in signals from tape recorders, DAT machines, CD players, etc. And, of course, you need a microphone for recording commentary. But what about titles and graphics, like the ones you are watching at the moment? These are best generated by using a computer. You'll need to make VHS copies to see them on domestic equipment or show it to your clients. So facilities for making VHS recordings are necessary. That is the simplest setup would be required for making professional quality films. Behind me is the edit suite, which you've seen on the computer. Here are the two source machines, in this case Hi8 and Hi Band SP, and we're editing onto the edit machine, which is Hi Band SP. Here is the edit controller, and this is the vision mixer and special effects generator. That's associated with the two time based correctors, which are here. This is the audio mixer and graphics are done on the computer, which is over there. The interesting part is when you start using this equipment artistically. OK, so could you perhaps tell us a bit about the editing process and how it works? Yes, well, the important thing about any film is the way the story flows. And this is tied up very closely with transitions, how each shot relates to the shot before and the shot afterwards. I'm going to show you a sequence and explain how we came to design it that way. Here we're showing cider being made in a small country mill. Very good cider it is too. Our problem here is to get from this sequence to the ghost story, which comes later on in the film. I notice you use a lot of close-ups in quick succession here. Oh yes, well, the whole process of making cider takes quite a long time, of course, and we haven't time to show it in the film. So cutaways enable you to cut out quite large sections of the process without apparently upsetting the flow. And you do all these with the same camera? Oh, yes, yes. Each shot, of course, has to be carefully lit for, for two things. Firstly, to look effective in its own right, 
and secondly, so that it matches in with the other shots. Now we come to a, the beginning of the next transition. We move from the cider mill itself into the little shop which is associated with it, and the commentator will talk about how uh, big shops like Harrods will sell their cider, but it's also on sale in the little rustic shop here. Now the next transition. We know that cider is made in the autumn, the apples fall, and this leads us to trees and the arboretum it, with the beautiful autumn colours. This we wanted to treat very romantically, so you'll see it's shot soft focus and with very nice music. The story would, of course, become a little bit boring if you keep it always the same, so we put in a little surprise. Something unexpected. Isn't that quite difficult to do, moving from focusing on one object to another? Not really. The main thing is that you, you rehearse it first and mark the positions on the focus scale, and then the assistant moves the focus from the wide shot to the close shot. Here we see the, these buildings which are associated with the, the Queenswood Park where we're shooting this. And it begins to lead us into the next transition. All this has taken place in the autumn when the leaves fall. And leaves falling imply bare trees which look beautiful against the, the sky. And when the sun shines through them, it looks remarkably like a fire. And so our logical transition is to a real fire and to the landlord of the pub telling his ghost story. Of course, he doesn't get it always right, and it goes on, on a little bit. It's a little bit long-winded. So we have cutaways to enable us to uh, use the bits of the soundtrack we want without ugly jumps in the picture. And you see, we've lit it very carefully to simulate firelight, including a flickering effect. How have you done that? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a very much Heath Robinson process, actually, by using lights with different coloured filters in front of them and uh, waving fingers or bits of rag in front of the light. Now we've come to the town, and he's going to tell, he's telling us about the story. This is the home of the family which we're talking about, and you notice there I did a very slow mix between two very similar shots. And it gives a slightly confusing effect, which is exactly what we're trying to do. And then we move into the effigies of the family in the church, show where they are in relation to the church. Establishes the scene, that widely. Exactly, shot, yes. And here we're talking about the man's prowess as a warrior, ending with the fact that he was killed in battle and showing a sword. Now we come to the ghost itself, and we introduce his dog. We tell a legend of how local villagers are frightened to go near the house at night, just in case. And the family in question actually were related to the Baskerville family, and this, of course, leads us to the very well-known writer, Conan Doyle. Well, perhaps that'll give you some idea of how a sequence is planned and how you get from one place to another smoothly without any glitches. Now I'm going to show you the sequence again without my drawing all over it, so you can see it as it was intended to be seen. and delicious cider is sold in London's top stores.
as well as locally. And here in the small shop that adjoins the mill. But it's still not quite that um, the Well, that's medium drive, single drive. The last of the apples have fallen in the orchards, but at Queenswood Country Park, near Leominster, the trees are in their full autumnal glory. What a feast of colour there is to be seen at this time of the year. Besides the beauty of the autumn colours, there are a few surprises to discover as well. No wonder it's so popular with school parties. Nature lovers can enjoy this park right through the year. And it's all free. The visitor's centre and cafe are also interesting. They're housed in two old buildings rescued from demolition. The old tannery from Leominster and the 300-year-old Essex Arms from Hereford. Even when the leaves have fallen and the trees are bare, they are still beautiful with their branches forming patterns against the winter sky. Winter in the countryside has its compensations like a cheerful fire to gather round on a cold, dark evening. This is the time for storytelling and the spinning of a good yarn. We went upstairs, sat in a cup of coffee and biscuits, and my wife went off to bed, and I know I to sleep for a few minutes. I suddenly woke up, and I watched James Cagney, so I was only watching, I could feel this form in the doorway, I could see a form in the doorway. When it comes to ghost stories, it's hard to beat the small border town of Kington, which has been buzzing with them for centuries. Most of these stories seem to be associated with the haunted house of Hargist Court. Nowadays, it is a private residence and not open to the public. But once, it was the home of the notorious Vaughan family. These are the effigies of Thomas Vaughan, known as Black Vaughan, and his wife, Ellen the Terrible who are buried in the church of St. Mary. In the Wars of the Roses, Thomas, despite his 69 years, fought bravely for the Yorkists at the Battle of Banbury, where he was killed in 1469. One of the many legends has it that, ever since, the ghost of his great black dog has haunted the house and its surroundings. There are still those who won't come near this place at night and others who even claim to have seen the ghost itself. The apparition is said to have appeared before a death in the family. And it is thought that this is the story which inspired Conan Doyle to write his Hound of the Baskervilles. Well, thanks very much indeed for all that excellent information, Derek. Not at all. It's a pleasure. OK, and we're now ready to move on to something involving the Amiga a little more closely. Let's now look in more detail at the Amiga, and specifically at video hardware for the Amiga. Though first, it might be well worth recapping which model of Amiga is the best investment. Your choice, essentially, is between the A1200 and the A4000. Both these machines feature the newer AGA chipset, which gives you the use of new screen modes, including extra high resolution modes, and modes that give more colours. The HAM8 mode, for instance, means that you can use up to 262,000 colours on the screen, which for video purposes is more or less as good as true colour. Though we'll talk a little more about 24-bit photographic quality graphics shortly. Now the A1200 has the very real advantage of a composite output which means you can lay Amiga graphics straight down to videotape without needing a genlock, and that could be useful. Generally, you'll be using a genlock anyway to overlay Amiga graphics onto a video image, so the genlock converts the Amiga RGB monitor output into a signal that video can use. 
And if you need to, you can, of course, use the Genlock in Amiga-only mode to run down Amiga graphics without any keying or mixing. What I'm saying is that a composite output isn't vital, but it would be nice to have one on the A4000 just in case. And it seems a shame that Commodore didn't put it on the top-end Amiga. After all, the original Amiga, the A1000, had a composite output, and that was way back in 1986. However, that's pretty much by the by. The other advantage both the A1200 and A4000 share is that they can have two megabytes of chip memory, which is the part of its RAM memory that the Amiga uses specifically for animation. Whether it's just scrolling titles or actual cartoon-style stuff, animation is likely to be one of the main things you'll be using the Amiga for in a semi-professional video system, as Derek Wharton showed us earlier on. OK, so the A1200 and A4000 are both pretty much equal so far. What's likely to sway your choice between the two? Well, one factor is the cost, because the Amiga 1200 is an awful lot cheaper. What might make you decide to go for the A4000, however, is simply the big box configuration. You can expand it with lots of hard disk space and the like, but the key thing will probably be the fact that the A4000 can be fitted with a 24-bit graphics card. And that, more or less, is the overriding element in the choice. Go for the A4000 and be prepared to spend a massive amount more on memory and hard disk space if you want to dabble in 24-bit graphics. Now let's look at add-on video hardware. Really, the main item is a Genlock, though video digitizers can be pretty useful for video work. We discuss Genlocks in slightly more detail in the Beginner's Guide to Desktop Video, which precedes this program in our video series. But let's just recap briefly. The Genlock is used to overlay Amiga graphics like these titles on top of a video picture. It works by taking a flat area of a single colour on the Amiga screen and dropping the video picture into that colour. All the other colours on the Amiga screen show through on top of the video picture. The background colour doesn't. There's a wide range of Genlocks on sale, varying in price hugely, but your start point would probably be the Rendell 8803, which you can buy for about £170. Just to explain the word Genlock, it's actually short for General Locking, because what a Genlock does in broad video terms is to synchronise and lock together two video signals. In Amiga terms, it just so happens that one of the two signals is the Amiga's screen display, and your reason for locking the two signals is so that you can colour key a video picture into the Amiga graphics. But you ought to be aware that when Amiga people use the word genlocking to describe what's effectively a colour keying process, they're strictly speaking misusing the word. Anyway, when you're buying a genlock, remember that what you're looking for is the purest through signal that you can get and buy accordingly. More expensive models aren't necessarily better. Genlocks apart, there are only a few video-specific items of hardware on the market. One we simply have to mention is the famous video toaster, which is used by many an American broadcast network, and it effectively turns an Amiga into a full special effects unit and video mixer, as well as being a caption generator, a titler, and an animation workstation. The snag is that the video toaster only works with the American NTSC television system, the PAL version is said to be on the way. You can buy a gadget called the Standards Converter to convert from NTSC to PAL, but it's hardly a perfect solution. This, however, is available right now in the UK, and very much of use to anyone with a PAL editing setup. It's basically a time-based corrector, or TBC, and it's made by GVP of America, who have been famous for their quality Amiga hardware for a long time. This is called the TBC Plus, and the plus in its name is meant to tell you that it does a whole lot more than you'd normally expect from a dedicated TBC unit. As we saw earlier in Derek Waterman's professional studio, the TBC is used to put straight the timing errors in a video signal that inevitably appear because the video players are pretty basic mechanical devices. Without the TBC, the picture tends to get an attack of the jitters. The TBC Plus, which was very highly rated in an Amiga format review, does that basic function, but it also has many more features it includes a proc amp, a process amplifier, which can clean up your signal, and it claims to give broadcast quality output, which is pretty impressive. Its extra features come as a result of the fact that it basically works by digitising the incoming signal in true colour and in real time. So it can also be used as a frame grabber, a digitizer, in other words. And you can also use it as a complete real-time digital video effects unit. And it even acts as a standards converter. 
All in all, the TBC Plus has to be highly recommended for any serious Amiga video studio, and it will fit snugly inside an Amiga 3000 or an Amiga 4000. OK, so that's a glimpse of specific video hardware for the Amiga. Let's now take a brief look at video digitising. A digitizer is basically a gadget that takes one frame of a video signal and grabs it as a still, and then turns it into digital form so that you can then treat that frame like any other Amiga bitmap picture, loading it into a paint package or image processing program to play around with. It's mainly used for grabbing frames of your video and image processing them, but it can also be used for doing traditional animation on paper, then digitizing it in and running it as an Amiga animation. The things you're looking for in a digitizer for video work, therefore, are twofold. One, the ability to grab in real time at 1 25th of a second. Some older models couldn't manage this and actually used several frames to build up a static image, so they had to have a static supply. And two, that each frame grabbed should have as many colours as possible, so that it reflects the original as closely as possible. Digitizers have improved enormously in recent years, and a real-time 12-bit or 24-bit model should not be too hard to come by at quite a reasonable price. OK, to round off our look at hardware, let's take a glance at 24-bit graphics cards. The idea is that 24 bits of data for each pixel gives you a binary number 24 digits long that you can use to describe the colour of a pixel. That binary number could be anything from 0 to 16,777,215. So you have almost 17 million different colours to play with. Now, a high-resolution interlaced screen on the Amiga would be 640 pixels across and 512 down. And if you multiply this up, it gives you about 328,000 pixels on the screen at one time. So even if every single one were a different colour, you'd get nowhere near 16 million colours. So why is 24 bits the true colour standard? Well, here's an experiment you can try at home if you have an Amiga 1200 or 4000, because they have 24-bit palettes. The theory is that the human eye cannot distinguish between more than about 200 different shades of any one colour. So since computers handily figure 256 colours as 8 bits, 256 is taken as the full range of shades of one colour. Try setting a palette in an AGA paint programme of, for example, 256 shades of red and see how subtle the shading between them is. If the maximum you need of any single colour is 256 shades, then the maximum you could possibly need in a TV or computer image made up of red, green and blue is 256 of each. And if you then multiply up those three options to find the total number of colours you could have, you get that figure of 16,777,216. To be able to choose between all of those, you then have to extend your Amiga's graphics capabilities by buying a 24-bit graphics card. We've got one in this Amiga 4000. The only problem with Amiga 24-bit graphics currently is that 24-bit cards remain expensive, though the results they give are pretty stunning. We're still awaiting the emergence of a truly retargetable graphics standard too, so that 24-bit graphics software doesn't have to have specific drivers to work with particular cards. And until that happens, it remains, in my opinion, an area of Amiga use that's best left to the specialists. Well, it's now time to move on and take a look at how image processing works and how it can be used in video. To do image processing, all you need is an image processing program, so that's simple enough. There are several obvious choices, the main ones being Art Department Professional from ASTG, Image Master from Black Belt, and Image Effects from GVP, who are better known for their hardware. The paint program Personal Paint also includes some interesting effects, so that's a good way of getting started if you don't want to splash out on new software just yet. In case you're wondering what the point of image processing is, it can be used either to create interesting static screens, such as backgrounds, titles and logos, or to alter video images frame by frame, which is an awful lot slower than real-time digital video effects, but is actually much more flexible. We're going to show you some simple examples using the paint package Personal Paint. 
The first thing you can use an image processing program for is collating, which is the electronic version of collage. It involves combining multiple images. There's three things that will help you out here. Stencils, anti-aliasing and blurring. Stencils you should be familiar with from a paint package. They're simply used to blanky off areas of an image or particular colours so that you can't draw over them. Anti-aliasing is a process that smooths out the jagged edges of a pixel line. It does this by making it fade into the background by using extra colours to fill in the edge so that the jagged pixels aren't so very noticeable. Blurring is a similar process to anti-aliasing but it tends to be applied to a broad area of an image rather than just to the edge of a brush or of a line or of lettering. Blurring tends to be available as a filter which brings us on to the subject of filters generally. Filters are controls that can be applied to a whole image or to an area of an image to change them. Programs like Art Department Professional come with a whole range built in that you can use at the press of an on-screen button, but there are others which you must set up for yourself. The two you'll come across most frequently are dithering and convolutions, and you'll find both of these in Personal Paint too. Dithering basically shuffles around the pixels on an image so that it smooths out variations, which can be used for all sorts of weird effects as well as to bring out detail or to hide the fact that an image uses a limited number of colours. In particular, dithering black and white images preserves detail while minimising the amount of memory they use, while the infamous Floyd Steinberg dithering is a favourite for smoothing out the flat bands of colour that result when you reduce the number of colours in an image. Convolutions are applied in a highly mathematical way using a matrix, a grid of numbers like this which can at first be rather hard to understand. The only way to learn about them is to experiment. In this example, we can create a simple blur filter using our convolution matrix. But you can also get effects such as edge detection, sharpening, removing noise and embossing in this way. Of course, it's much easier to do if an image processing program has preset buttons to do these things for you. But the preset effects will all be using convolution matrices in just the same way. Let's take a look at some of the preset effects that you might have in an image processing program. For starters, you would usually expect to be able to turn an image into monochrome instead of colour. And you should also be able to give an image colour effects such as negative colour, or perhaps even more fancy effects like pseudo-colouring, posterization, or solarising. Other effects aren't necessarily related to colour. Some, like the now popular watercolour effect, are a sophisticated kind of blur. Spirals and motion blurs are other popular variations on the same theme. Another good example of a built-in effect often seen in image processing is edge detection, which can be used to turn an image into something approaching a line drawing. And there's also embossing, which cuts out a shape and gives it a raised three-dimensional look. OK, so image processing can be fun, but it only works on single frames, and so it takes an age to apply an effect to a whole series of video frames. Let's just mention two bits of software the work with moving images, and so more in the line of what you'd call special effects programs. The first is Adorage, which is the only modern program on the market that attempts to do something akin to what digital video effects, or DVE units, do it in a normal video studio. It takes a picture, which could, for example, be a digitised still frame from your video, and enables you to build that into an animation that imitates the effects of fancy video transitions, such as page turns, fly-offs, particle effects and roll-ons. The other type of special effects program that's fun to explore is a morphing package, and there's several available, with the easiest and cheapest being Cinemorph, and the most complex but best being ASTG's Morph Plus. What a morphing package does is take two completely different pictures for start and end points, and generate an animation that turns one into the other. It's the kind of thing you must have seen dozens of times on TV ads, turning cars into horses, and that about wraps it up for image processing, but you should have a reasonable idea by now of some of the many things you can do, given time and imagination. Now to finish off, let's take a further look at some professional video tips and terminology. First, let's cover the basic kinds of shot that you can use when you're filming. And remember that you want to specify each type of shot in your script so you do need to think in advance about the way you're going to film. 
Remember also that varying shots allows you flexibility at the editing stage, so it can be wise to film the same thing several times from different angles. Remember that when a person is talking, you can't cut from one similar shot to another, or the person will simply jump. It looks pretty silly. So cutting to a different shot before coming back to the person is vital to avoid that jump, but it also helps you to cover up mistakes and can be used to cut down a long sequence that you don't want all of, a technique which is called time compression. Your basic choice of shots starts off with the wide shot, which is ideal for establishing a scene by giving the viewer a sense of place and a sense of the geography of the scene. Next up is the medium shot, which can often be more comfortable. One useful technique to bear in mind is getting whoever you're pointing the camera at to turn into a shot. In this case, because we haven't used this camera angle before, it almost makes the scene seem like an aside, as if it were in brackets. And I can turn back to the main business at the end. A closer tight shot like this can be a little intimidating but it also tends to be more involving if you're getting down to the nitty-gritty of the subject. It almost literally draws the viewer in. A close-up is an ideal way of getting you from one shot to another or covering up a cut, so it helps in the edit to have a lot of these, and for that reason, they tend to be called cutaways. The close-up has the equally functional purpose of showing detail, as well as the artistic purpose of composing an attractive abstract shape and playing around a little with light. And when you've established what it is you're looking at by holding a slightly wider close-up, a few very swift cutaways of the detail add variety and a sense of movement. A way of adding interest to a longer close-up of a static object is to pan along it, putting the movement back into the shot. Another way to add interest in a shot is to travel into it, what you might normally call a zoom, but rather slower which tends to suggest that the viewer should be getting more involved in the subject as the shot progresses. And a good way to move from a discussion of a specific thing like this mouse here into a more general passage of your script is to start close on it and travel out, giving the sense that we're moving on to something else. Which in fact we are. We've covered the basic vocabulary of shots available to you, so let's now explain a few of the things that are second nature to professionals, but we mere TV watching mortals don't normally come across. First, I'd like to say a quick word about microphones. This is the shotgun mic we're using as a safety on this shoot, so there's two terms that need explaining for starters. A shotgun is a microphone that picks up sound in a tight, narrow beam, so it picks up whatever it's pointed at very clearly, but it doesn't pick up things off to the side very well at all. We're actually recording the sound you're hearing now using this tight-lit mic. But we've also got the shotgun down there, just in case anything goes wrong with our main soundtrack. And that's why it's called the safety. Setting microphones up for a shot is a highly specialised job, but remembering to take a safety is something everybody can do. Colour bars are the next thing I'd like to mention. You might have seen them on things and wondered what they're there for. Well, they simply act as a reference for the conditions under which you're recording, so that you can later adjust the levels of colour. Put some bars down on the start of your tape and later, if all the colours from your filming aren't quite what you expected, you can adjust the signal in a mixer until the colour bars look right, and then the rest of the stuff you've filmed should be right too. You can mix up a pretty decent approximation of Powell colour bars using these colour settings in a paint programme that uses values of 0 to 255 for each of red, green and blue, such as deluxe paint or personal paint. Next, we ought to mention time codes. A time code numbers every frame in a video using the format hours, down here, minutes, seconds, and frames. Obviously, the frames go past pretty swiftly. There's 25 in each second, whereas seconds and minutes both count up to 60. Not only does the time code allow you to identify every single frame and refer to specific points in the video where you might want to make a cut, but it's also actually the thing that controls where the video recorder lays down each frame it records, so it's crucial to accurate editing. There are several different abbreviations that you might see mentioned for time codes. There's also control tracks, which are the half-hearted domestic video player version, as used by all videos that register hours, minutes and seconds, instead of just a number on a counter. RTC and RCTC 
are both time codes invented by Sony for their Video 8 equipment, but by all accounts they don't work too well. The ones you want to worry about are LTC, which stands for Longitudinal Time Code, which is the less effective of the professional systems, and VITC, which stands for Vertical Interval Time Code, which is the one that professionals actually use. You might also hear mention of Burnt In Time Code, which refers to when the time code from the master tape is left on the duplicated copies for whatever reason. With that inside information under your belt, you might also like to know the meanings of a few of the terms used in video editing. First, there's AB roll editing, in which two source machines, player A and player B, are used so that you can mix and fade from one image to the other. Then there's assembly editing, which is the simplest kind, where you assemble the finished master in a linear sequence from start to finish by laying down the bits you want from source tapes. The opposite of that is insert editing, where you prepare a whole tape by blacking it, then put down the bits of footage you want in the places you want, in no particular chronological order. Obviously this takes more preparation because you have to know in advance the exact duration and running order of all the individual pieces of footage you use. While we're about it, you may hear video people talking about linear and non-linear editing suites. A linear system is a traditional tape-based process in which the source tapes have to be played and recorded to make up the edited version. But there's a growing movement towards non-linear systems, where the sources are digitised onto a hard disk drive and then assembled from there. Because you can jump to any point on the hard drive at any time, you lose the restrictions of linearity. Right, now let's look at signal formats. The only real problem here is that there's lots of abbreviations which can be quite confusing. For starters, we have RF, which stands for radio frequency, and that's the sort of signal the TV gets from the aerial. A composite signal is one in which all the different kinds of video information are mixed up, and so it's less pure. That's what ordinary VHS video recorders use. Composite is also referred to as CVBS, which apparently stands for colour, video, blanking and syncs, the four main elements of a video picture. Blanking, incidentally, is the time when the electron beam is returning to start a new scanline or a new frame on the TV picture. Next up from composite in quality is YC, or Luma Chroma, which is used by SVHS. With YC, there are separate signals for the luminance part of the picture, that's the Y, which represents contrast and brightness, and the chrominance, the C part, which represents all the colour. Top of the range is a component signal, as used by professional video formats, and component is also called YUV, or YCRCB. It not only has separate luminance and chrominance, but also separates chrominance into red and blue factors, giving a very pure signal. I'd just like to mention standard video connectors, and I've got a few examples here. The RF connector is an ordinary aerial cable plug, which you may have seen on the TV, and it looks pretty similar to the phono-style plug, although they're not actually the same, so don't get them mixed up. The other type of connector that's important is the BNC connector. We've got an example down here. This is a bayonet-style fitting, which actually twists to go into place. OK, so that's connectors. Now let's have a brief run through video formats. Remember that like computer formats, there's a confusing number of these and not all are compatible, so keep them clear in your mind. First, everyone knows VHS, the standard home recording format on half-inch tape, introduced in 1978. VHS stands for Video Home System and uses composite signals. And there is also VHS-C, the C standing for Compact, which uses smaller tapes for camcorders. Next up in quality are formats using YC signals, which start off with Super VHS or SVHS, which still uses the same half-inch tape and is again available in a compact camcorder version called SVHS-C. Its rivals are Video 8 and the improved version called Hi8, both of which were created by Sony. Leading the line are High Band SP, the SP standing for Superior Performance, which is used in the corporate and industrial markets, and also Betacam SP, a half-inch tape format from Sony used frequently in news gathering. There's also the rival M2 format, developed by JVC and Panasonic to compete with Betacam SP. Right at the top of the range you have the digital formats D2, D3 and D5, 
which are used for studio broadcast quality work. And you'll still also come across one inch reel tape on open spools in use in large production environments such as broadcast drama. Pretty much that's all you need to know about video to be going on with. I'd also just like to mention a couple more advanced pointers about gen locking and titling work. First, a couple more bits of jargon. When you're dealing with moving titles, remember that scrolling means moving up the screen and never down because it's simply not natural. You read down a page, so the text must come up to meet you. Similarly, text that's travelling from the side of the screen is called crawling, not sideways scrolling, and should move always from right to left, because you read left to right, and again, it has to come to meet your eye. One titling fact I'd also like to show you is an embossed look. You can do this easily in personal paint, using the brush process mode and selecting the emboss option. Emboss high is the better choice. If you simply wait for this to render you'll notice that it then highlights the brush with dark areas at the top and light areas at the bottom which gives it a feel of a 3D emboss title. This kind of titling can look very effective used in the right place. And here's that embossed look in action. Right, one other thing we ought to mention is using overscan graphics modes. The idea is that you don't get video shown through around the edge of your genlocked Amiga graphics. You can set the overscan in the preferences section of your workbench. And when you're editing it, you can also position the screen accurately using the preferences program. Because genlocks will often shift the position of the screen around the display. And that, I'm afraid, is really all we have time for. It's such a broad subject at this level that we can't go into all the detail we would like. But there should be plenty here for you to mull over. For more detailed coverage of some of the Amiga graphics subjects we've mentioned in this video, I can recommend this book, The Amiga Format Guide to Desktop Video. Well, thanks for your time, and the very best of luck with all your Amiga video productions. We've produced this series of videos as part of our commitment to you, our readers. If you have any suggestions on how we should improve the videos or the magazine itself, please write to me, Steve Jarrett, at the address at the end of this video. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Additional videos in the Amiga format range include personal paint, an introduction to the A1200, A1200 hard drives, upgrading your machine, Music X, multimedia, desktop video volume 1, desktop video volume 2, and finally the Amiga format guide to Clarissa. Priced at just $14.99 each, or any three for $34.95, they represent excellent value for money. For further details, contact BVG at the address given at the end of this video.